I loved my car. I'm not sure how vain that makes me sound at the start of this story, but it's the truth. In fact, a few years ago, the only thing I would have said I loved more than my car was life itself. Can't drive if you're dead, right? I never thought I'd have to choose between the two. My 1960 Cadillac Sedan DeVille with its dropped suspension and black chrome accessories or my actual life. I'm embarrassed to say it, but the choice wasn't easy. Watching a monster tear apart the vehicle I'd pour my sweat, time, and savings into was probably harder than dying. I guess I'll never know for sure. The Cadillac helped me stand out from the rest of the rural Arizona community. It was part of a lifestyle and aesthetic that I guess I inherited from my father, who brought his particular taste to the farmland after moving from Los Angeles. Maybe I valued that even more than the chrome. That vehicle kept me connected to my dad. When it died, it was like losing him all over again. But I'm getting too sentimental. This story isn't about my father or the connection we failed to rebuild while he was still around. This story is about the beast. My neighbors are all miles away. We don't talk often, not unless there's an emergency. I heard whispers from them on a trip to town. Rumors that the family to the south of my land had seen a strange animal skirting the edge of their pond. It was a hot summer, I told myself. Any creature with a tongue would be stopping by that pond as it was the only source of fresh water for quite some distance. I didn't expect the opossums or the wild dogs to have a real grasp of drawing water from a well. They did describe the animal in a peculiar, though. They called it a naked bear. Now I'd seen pictures of starved and diseased bears online, so the image came to mind very quickly. But bears weren't exactly common in our area. I couldn't imagine what one would have been doing on our land. Looking back, I think it was just lost. Certainly that happens on rare occasion, right? I didn't take any stock in those stories. I went home as usual, parked my car in the usual spot in the shade of an old maple tree, and didn't bother to roll the windows. When the forecast was clear, I never did. But I woke that night to the sound of the Cadillac's horn blaring. It bleated once and twice, loud enough both times to stir me from my bedroom and then fell silent. I thought it might be some kids messing around with the car so I ran out quickly and unprepared. But it wasn't a kid in my car. It was an animal that had scratched and clawed its way up and through the open window. Crammed its sickly thin body through the narrow space just to get a closer look at the leather interior. I caught its body in the beam of my flashlight, and I froze. It wasn't a naked bear, but I did understand the comparisons. It was the size of a large dog. Maybe it would have been bigger if it had any meat on its bones, and it did have a head that was vaguely ursine. The issue was the spines on its back, long and raised in a single row like a mohawk of bones. The issue was its tube-shaped tongue which I saw unfurl and flop from its mouth like a butterfly's proboscis. The issue was its feet, which ended universally in sharp claws too long and too straight for any animal I'd ever known. They grew like knives instead of fingernails. They were knives which, at the present moment, were slicing through my seats like butter. I gasped and lurched forward and thought to open the door and start wrestling with the thing. The boils on its back made me pause. It wasn't a bear, but it was sick. Lesions grew around its shoulder blades and its strange tongue was thick with a yellow mucus-like spit. I didn't want to deal with any part of that. Instead, I watched. It was burrowing into the seats like a squirrel carving out its next hiding place. Maybe it was building a nest, somewhere safe and warm for the night. I stood there with my heart in my throat until an idea came to mind. The inside of the car was ruined by then, but maybe I could still get the monster off of my property. I ran back inside and grabbed my keys, triggering the alarm on the Cadillac. The car wailed in a deafening blinking pattern. I couldn't help but think of it as the death throes of my lovely little vehicle. The shrieking was enough to send the monster into a frenzy. It jerked around the interior before spilling back out of the window and rolling to its feet. I watched it run clear off of my property, and then I stood and waited again. That time I was waiting for sunrise. 
I needed to assess the damage but couldn't bring myself to do it with only a torch to light my way. When dawn broke, I cried. The interior could be replaced. The stink of the creature's saliva could have been washed out with enough attempts and enough conviction. The doors, where its claws had cleaved into the metal, could have been swapped for assembly line parts. But I felt like I was looking at a corpse. I loved that car. I wanted to protect it as though it was the last memory of my father, and instead I'd let it be destroyed. I parked it in a barn and left it there. Finding the monster became my priority, but I've never had success. The sick bear or the dog with the butterfly tongue, whatever you want to call it, have you seen it? Because I owe that creature a world of punishment for the damage it did that night. As a park ranger, every once in a while you come across a piece of abandoned property. It isn't uncommon. Things get left behind. Things get dumped in the shadowy place where no one thinks they'll be found. Most often you collect the property, try to contact the owners, and ultimately dispose of it. In some cases, however, you have to do a little more. There are certain items that demand more of you when you find them discarded on the trail. I came across a bicycle one afternoon. Adult size, rigged to make easy work of the sharp turns and winding hills of the dirt that cut through the forest. It was overturned on the side of the path. The weeds underneath its steel frame were reaching up from below it, coiling around the body of the bicycle like fingers trying to drag the structure back into the dirt. It had been there a while, I knew that. But aside from the dried mud on the tires, the bike looked brand new. They wouldn't have just left it. I called back to my peers over the radio and began to investigate, stepping over the bike and into the woods. There was a chance they'd left the trail for some reason and become lost, trapped, or injured. I called out, sharing my identity and scanning the brush for any signs of movement. The area became quiet. On the trail, I hadn't noticed it, but the moment I stepped off, it seemed like the ambient sounds of the forest had died down. I think in the moment my adrenaline was too high for my mind to register what was happening. I was too focused on the task at hand, saving a life. When a sound finally did penetrate that wall of silence, though, it wasn't at all what I was looking for. It was a howl, long-winded and bone-chilling. It penetrated straight through the goosebumps rising on my skin and sunk down into my very core. I was suddenly uncomfortably aware of my own heartbeat. I felt every thud in my chest, felt the pulsing in my ears and skull. The howl wasn't like anything I'd heard before. My training took over, my responsibility to the individual who was probably lost in the forest around me. That's what kept me from running, at least at first. Then, the creature emerged from the wilderness. It stepped out from behind a tree, as if it had been hiding there and watching me. Its body was long and slender, probably six feet from foot to shoulder. It looked like a dog or a wolf, massive and sickly. There were patches where its fur had gone missing, scars where it had tangled with something I can't imagine survived. It was an animal. I knew that much. Then it stood on its hind legs and everything I knew fell apart. It stood like a man and glared at me like I was going to be the next thing stuck between its teeth. I believed it. So I ran. I tore my way back to the trail and lifted the bike from the weeds. I heard the plant life snap, each of the earth's fingers breaking as I ripped the frame back upright. I didn't think I could outrun the monster, but maybe this would work. I pedaled as quickly as I could and prayed that the chain and tires were still properly aligned. If the bike had been discarded as damaged goods, I was doomed. Lucky for me, it was holding up. I was confident that I'd left the monster behind. I was already breathing lighter. I didn't slow down, but I did risk a glance behind me. My eyes didn't even make it that far. It was beside the bike. Running full speed, easily in pace with my pedaling, destroying every branch and bush in its way. I tried to yell, gasp, anything. I opened my mouth to scream, but it was already crashing into me. 
It slammed shoulder first into my side and sent me reeling. My face hit the ground first. I tasted dirt and grass and the blood already flowing between my teeth. My body rag dulled and rolled, tying up in knots before I landed several feet off of the trail. I was face up, squinting at the sky peeking back at me from beyond the tops of the trees. I knew surer than anything else that the monster was coming my way. I was going to be eaten, but the bite never came. The teeth and tongue never lashed my body. I was able to pull myself up somehow. The bike was ruined. The second crash on the trail was apparently too much for it to bear. The frame was twisted and the front tire was bent. There was no sign of my attacker, except for the patch of hair caught on the bicycle spokes. I grabbed that, thinking it would be my saving grace. It would prove that I wasn't crazy. More important, at least at the time, I thought it would be enough evidence to encourage the rest of the rangers to search for the original owner of the bike. When I brought it back and told my story, there were some snickers, but they ultimately decided to test the hair to see where it came from. The last thing I expected was for those results to come back human. The texture was all wrong, and I knew the beast I had seen wasn't anything close to human. How was it possible then? How could that have been the evidence that peeled off of the beast's body? It didn't make sense to me then, and it doesn't make sense to me now. Unfortunately, the rangers felt the same way. Efforts to find the missing person, if they even existed, were minimal. Efforts to track the monsters were non-existent. It was never found, and thus far never seen again. But what do you think? Is there a chance it turns back up? Is there a chance that the thing I saw was really just a man? We've all got a weird story, right? You've got one, don't you? I think everyone sees something they can't explain at least once in their life. Maybe for the most part that happens when we're young. We come to terms with the encounter after telling ourselves that our undeveloped minds just didn't know how to process something. We invented an outlandish memory or worse, deleted the experience from our minds entirely. Sometimes it happens after we've grown. We keep the story to ourselves or entrust it to our close friends. We share snippets of it with a therapist and listen closely as the encounter is broken down into more digestible parts. You agree with all that, don't you? Or am I just projecting? I thought that might be the case. Encounter. Kind of gives that away, doesn't it? Encounter says I met something and not all of these stories begin like that. That is how my story begins. I met something. And that experience was in no way digestible, not before or after the therapy. You see, I have a lot of trust in my own mind. I had to. My line of work was intimately entwined with fields like physics and aerodynamics. I signed too many documents to say outright what kind of work I did, but I think you can imagine the usefulness of a mind like mine. You can imagine how an individual or an organization might want to apply those fields of study to the practical world. You've got it, don't you? Good. Anyway, I learned to trust my mind. It was greatest muscle, refined and strengthened by years of study and application. To think that I just imagined the things I saw, well, that's preposterous. One night I arrived home from work to find a cloud sitting above my home. It was too high in the atmosphere to be considered a blanket of fog, but it was low enough to appear strangely centered over my single-story suburban house. I looked at it, tilted my head, wondered aloud if the weather was going to take a turn for the worse, and then I forgot all about it. The low-hanging black cloud. My therapist would say that my memory was painting that moment to be more colorful than it could have been, more theatrical and exciting. The black cloud was a visual metaphor that I invented, according to them. It symbolizes the trauma, the looming dread. I remember taking off my coat that night. I remember washing the dishes from breakfast that morning and taking a shower before bed. I remember pulling the blanket up to my shoulder. Then I remember the sound of metal scraping against metal. I remember the tug of restraints around my wrists and ankles. They felt like warm leather like a belt that had been laid out in the sun. I remember the cold, hard table underneath my back. 
I remember the bright lights blinking on and off overhead, playing with my senses like the poking of a stick. I remember the smell of chlorine and the faint burn that spread across my skin. I remember when the creatures stepped into frame. They sauntered into my peripheral vision and settled overhead. They were on top of me, looking down like a dentist white peer into an open mouth. I didn't feel any pain. I only felt the terror. I felt immeasurable fear as their large black eyes peered down at me. It seemed as though my body was being pulled in different directions like they'd cut me open to puppeteer my bones. I was a little marionette on that table, dancing whichever way the creatures demanded. Their skin was gray. Their heads were engorged, swollen like water balloons. Their lips were thin and pressed shut throughout the entirety of the encounter. They never spoke. They never needed to. They seemed to communicate silently. I wondered if their mouths were so small for the same reasons that mankind's pinky fingers had shrunk over the years. They didn't need them anymore. They had a better way of speaking and a better way of breathing. I fixated on that question instead of on what was happening to my body. I couldn't endure that vulnerability. I couldn't bring myself to acknowledge that I had no idea what these creatures were doing to me. The lights blinked. I felt them swimming in my organs. Then I remember waking up in my bed. The interior of my house was destroyed, as if every piece of furniture had been raised to the ceiling and then dropped back down. I called my peers and not the police. I trusted the tests that they would perform more than what might be done at a hospital. They never let me see the results. They never let me resume my work either. Eventually, I shared that tragedy with my friends. I shared with my therapist, like I said. They all have their theories. I invented the story to cope with the collapse of my career. I imagined the strange encounter when in reality someone very human had forced their way into my home and antagonized me while they were there. My favorite theory is that I'm willfully lying. Imagine that, will you? I'm so bored with my life that I've invented an excuse for everyone to call me a liar. I've purposefully given the world a reason to distrust me. I wish that were the case. I wish I could dismiss what happened as a dream. I wish I didn't still see that black cloud sometimes, hovering somewhere in the distance. I wonder if it's watching me, or if it's moved on to someone else. Maybe I'm just seeing the next place it plans to attack. Maybe I should be warning people of what's to come when the storm cloud parks itself just above your roof. Maybe, but maybe not. What do you think? What responsibility do I have now after being turned away as a liar? I always thought I was lucky to have a son who took an interest in my work. I didn't find the life of a park ranger to be particularly glamorous, so when he started asking questions about my job, I was surprised. It wasn't long after that when we started camping together, going on hikes, and immersing ourselves in the wilderness. I shared my knowledge as best I could. I taught him how to spot tracks in the spring and summer. I taught him how to build a fire in the fall and winter. He was prepared, I thought, although I didn't know exactly what for. Maybe he'd follow in my footsteps and spend his weeks patrolling our nation's great national parks. Maybe he'd pass that knowledge down to his own kids when the time came. I was wrong about a lot of things. He wasn't prepared, not really, and neither of us were lucky. When the thing in the woods crossed our path, each of us realized just how dangerous these parks really are. There are no manuals, no amount of training, and no weapons that can prepare you for the secrets Mother Nature still hides. We were setting up camp. Dusk was fast approaching. We'd picked out a pretty clear spot surrounded by fir trees. There weren't any tracks nearby and there were no signs of nesting, either in our area or in a 15-foot radius around our site. We thought we were in the clear. We'd be lucky to see a passing deer. Before we could even erect our tents, though, the knocking started. We listened at first, trying to silently decide if we were hearing something natural. Sometimes you'll hear a buck grinding their antlers against a smaller tree. This sound was more unique. 
It was rhythmic. There was an undeniable pattern to it. Something intelligent. It wasn't Morse code, but it felt similar. Like the distant knocks were speaking in a language that we just didn't know. So we called out. We went looking. My son was 13 and intelligent enough to hang back or to run if he needed to. But we were both convinced that we were hearing the efforts of a man or woman stuck in the area nearby. They could have been trapped, injured, or malnourished. They couldn't speak, that much was clear, but we believed they were asking for help. The average person wouldn't know Morse code. They'd just be making whatever noises they could to get somebody's attention. They had our attention, at least. But they weren't human. We agreed on the direction the sounds were coming from, and we moved toward it. After walking maybe a dozen feet outside of our camp's perimeter, the knocking abruptly ended. We heard something scrape past the trees, like thick fur tangling in dry branches. That sound passed us like birds on the wind, quick and fluttering. We tried to turn our heads and follow the sounds as they ran around us, but we couldn't make out the shape of whatever was out there. It was moving too quickly to be a man. We stood back to back, turning in a circle to keep our eyes on the woods. I remember seeing goosebumps on my son's arms. They matched the hairs standing up on my own neck. We both felt the same way. We'd stumbled into a trap of some kind. We were being hunted. Our only chance, I thought, was to make ourselves look big. Don't show any fear. Make it look like the meat on our bones wouldn't be worth the fight. Then my son spotted the thing in the trees. He screamed and pointed. My eyes followed his finger. It was twice the size of either of us. Approaching eight feet tall with a hunch in its back that meant it was probably even taller. Standing on two feet. Covered in the exact fur that I had imagined, thick and matted and the color of the autumn leaves. I'd never seen an animal so wide. My son and I, standing shoulder to shoulder, barely matches the width of its chest. It stood there, half hidden by the fur, and just watched. It glared at us, chewing on its lip like a daydreaming child. Its brow jutted out and its forehead was tall and narrow. It looked like an ape of some kind. Its long arms nearly scraped the ground, even from its upright position. It was hard not to imagine those arms tearing through the trees around us. Our bodies would break even easier than that. It took in one more big breath, filling its lungs to the brim. I flinched when I thought it might roar. But then the beast turned and ran away. It disappeared back into the woods, leaving both of us with wide eyes and open mouths. That was the first time my son asked a question about the woods that I couldn't answer. That was the first time I even considered that we might be in danger out there in the trees. How could we prepare for that? How could we sleep soundly, knowing that it was out there watching us? That night, we didn't. We packed up and drove all night to crawl back into our own beds. We haven't gone camping since either. We haven't visited the trails. Unfortunately for me, I haven't seen the beast again, even after volunteering for more work with the parks. I wanted to get a picture of it. I wanted to have evidence that someone could point to and proclaim, I know what that is. After that, I figured I might feel safe again. I might go back out there with my kid. The woods might be our special place again, but I'm starting to think that will never happen. There are no answers for these kinds of things, are there? There's no one coming along to explain what we encountered. You haven't seen it, have you? You don't have the proof that I need, do you? These stories always take place on land, don't they? That's how I always hear them, at least. Chased through the woods, watched through the windows. I've dealt with things on land. Wild dogs with the taste of your skin on their mind. People pushed past their limits and looking for a way out. I've seen a lot of things on the force. Most of them I handled well. Some of them I wasn't quite trained for. My real problem was the day that I encountered something on the lake. How do you stop something when it's coming from beneath you? How do you escape it when it already has you surrounded? I'll jump ahead and spoil the ending since I'm sure you've already guessed. 
I didn't stop the monster that day. I didn't escape it either. I used to spend my days off at the lake, sometimes on the shore, sometimes in my boat. No matter what, the hours always passed a little easier when there was a fishing pole in my hands. I don't remember catching anything on that particular day. I remember the water being still, actually. It was like I'd driven across the surface of a mirror. The only thing moving in that lake, at least at first, was my reflection. Then something knocked against my boat. Rocked the whole thing from side to side nearly made me drop my pole. What was it? I was coming up empty as far as explanations were concerned. I looked over the edge expecting to see a log or something bobbing underneath the surface. Sometimes a storm would uproot a tree and send the whole thing sliding into our lake. It had float there just out of sight until tangling with some fisherman's line or knocking on the underside of a vessel. That wasn't the case. There was nothing in the water, nothing that I could see. Whatever had brushed my boat had already swam away. I should have been afraid that very moment. Instead, I was excited. I thought maybe I'd drifted onto the path of a gar or a sturgeon. That meant there was something here for me to catch. Little did I know, I was the one on the line. I watched the surface of the lake even closer than before. That's the thing about fishing. You aren't always hunting with your eyes. Sometimes you're waiting for the tug of the line or the sound of the pole shifting in its stand. I needed to see it, though. If I could set my eyes on it, I could wrangle it. I could lug it up the shore and take one of those pictures with the freshwater monster in my hands. But I didn't see a fish. I saw a blur. I saw the gray shift of some unintelligible shape far below the surface of the water, too far beyond the rays of the sun for my eyes to decipher what it was. I could only tell that it was big, big and fast but strangely agile. Something as large as the shape I saw moving underneath the lake should have disturbed the water a great deal. It barely budged. When the amorphous gray movement disappeared somewhere lower in the water, I felt the anxiety finally creeping into my bones. The cold sweat on the back of my neck and the sinking feeling in my stomach. Something was very wrong here. If the fish weren't out today, I shouldn't have been either. I turned to activate the motor and head back to shore. Suddenly the boat lurched again, this time rolling across the water and dumping me into the depths. Something callous and rigid scraped across my leg. I felt it even through my pants. I hurried to orient myself, to remember which way was up. I unlaced my boots and kicked them off before the steel toes could drag me down any further. I started swimming. I couldn't believe how far down the momentum had dragged me and then the shape passed overhead. It blacked out the blinking light of the sun passing through the water. It enveloped me completely in darkness. I could barely make out the shape of fins ahead of me. Each one was at least two feet long. It had a body the size of a small car. Its neck was long, or maybe that was its tail. Things smeared together down there, creating an unknowable creature painting a monster in broad strokes that I couldn't define in the dim light of the lake. It passed overhead, long and slow. I thought my lungs might burst with how badly they were burning, and then it was gone. I had a clear path to the surface and I took it. I sucked in air loud and frantic. I coughed and I spit and blinked the burning tears from my eyes. The boat wasn't far. I made it back inside somehow. The engine still worked. Before I knew it, I was crawling across the shoreline and laying my face in the mud. I heaved and choked. The motor kept screaming behind me, trying to propel the boat even though it had hit dry land. It must have been twenty minutes before someone found me. They helped me to my feet, uninjured and no worse for wear. At the time, I could only point at the lake. When nothing turned up after that, I became the butt of my friend's jokes. Little by little, my peers stopped taking me seriously. All my credibility was gone just because I had seen something that no one else had encountered. I got stuck with the undesirable jobs. Eventually, when I asked my superiors if we could dedicate some manpower to thoroughly searching the lake, I was laughed off the force. I wasn't trained for that either. It hurt. 
embarrassment grew in me like a weed. And that weed still sits there. I try telling this story, but no one wants to hear it. These stories always take place on the ground, understand? I guess it's easier to face the idea of a monster in the woods than it is to imagine something lurking beneath the water.